Tuesday, February 19th at 6.02 p.m. City Clerk, has this meeting been properly noticed? Yes, it has. Thank you. Can I have a roll call, please? Council Member Williams? Present. Council Member Lopez Ortega? Here. Council Member Kraus? Here. Vice Mayor Dunsford? Please note Absent. that he has an excused absence. And Mayor Canning? Here. Thank you very much. Uh, please all stand and join me for a salute to the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Good evening, all. If you have not already done so, please silence your cell phone. And Mr. Harkin, could you please close that back door for us? We're paying for heat, you know? It's a little brisk here in Calistoga this week. Um, we did have a closed session uh, prior to this for, uh, with this council at 5.30 p.m. It was to uh, discuss conference with labor negotiation under government code 54957.6. The name of the negotiating party is the city manager, Dylan Feek, and the employee organization that we were discussing was the Calistoga Public Employees Association, and there is no reportable action at this time. We will now move on to oral communication. This, this is time set aside to receive comments from the public regarding matters on the consent calendar or matters of municipal concern that are not on the agenda. Pursuant to Government Code Section 54954.3, also known as the Brown Act. However, the Council cannot consider any issues or take action on any request during this comment period. Speakers are encouraged to limit their comments to a maximum of three minutes so that all speakers have an opportunity to address the City Council. I do not have any speaker cards, but is there anyone in the public that would like to address the council on a consent item or a non-agendized item this evening? Not seeing any, I will, anyone move toward the podium, I will close oral communication and I will entertain a motion to adopt this evening's agenda as presented and I'll say modification is requested. So moved. Second. I have a motion by Council Member Krause, I have a second by Council Member Lopez Ortega. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Any opposed? Thank you. Council requests and ideas for discussion. Council Member Lopez Ortega, please. Yes, um, briefly, I just want to invite the rest of the council or any other uh, person interested to attend the well um, annual conference. Um, well is means water education for Latino leaders. It's going to be taking place March 28 and March 29 in, Los, in Long Beach. And this is about education, about everything that has to do with water, the history, um, the distribution, um, how it affects, you know, um, our, our towns and how it affects the whole California, the whole state. It's very interesting. It's very, uh, I've been attending since I enjoyed the city councils um, six years ago. So this is going to be the seventh conference then. I will invite you, especially you, that you know that uh, you are new to this, so that will be very good. There is a scholarship available for uh, Thank you. Council Member Williams. Nothing tonight. Thank you. Council Member Krause. I don't have anything either. Excellent. And I do not have anything this evening either. So we'll move on to the city. Uh, sorry, correction. Unless, are you going to be addressing Lincoln Avenue Bridge? Okay. We, nope, we go for it. We'll now move on to the city manager's report. City manager Feek. All right, as the mayor was alluding to, next week on Wednesday, February 27th at 10 a.m., there will be a small ceremony to acknowledge the, uh, I'll call it, the rededication of the Lincoln Avenue Bridge. As we all know, this project's been under construction for quite a while. It's created quite a, ha quite a hassle for many of us, but we're very excited that Caltrans is nearing a substantial completion of the project. It won't be fully done next Wednesday, but uh, certainly we're looking forward to seeing that project completed. Uh, the other item that I wanted to share, and just in her zeal to learn more about all things water, uh, tomorrow I'll be going with uh, Councilmember Lopez Ortega to take a tour of the Dunawheel Wastewater Treatment Plant, also the new phage water tank. I encourage people to become aware of the things we're doing. As you remember, last week's city or uh, the last city council meeting, Public Works Director Mike Kern gave a great update on a lot of the improvements uh, that we've been making in the water system, both water and wastewater. Um, as silly as it sounds, we actually received an email. 
uh, uh, thank you uh, recently, which we forwarded to council. It's been much more commonplace in recent memory that we receive complaints or concerns about water quality. But now as we start to see our numbers move, you know, being driven downwards by our excellent public works staff, we're also starting to see uh, some praise and, and thanks for the work that we're doing. So we're very grateful for the hard work of our public works staff. That's all I have this evening. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll now move on to proclamations, presentations, and awards. And this evening we have a presentation by administration. So this is meeting two, and you're jumping right in already with a presentation. I like that. If you would, please share with us your name and the position you hold here in the city of Calistoga. And while you're there, how long have you been in that position? <laughs> <laughs> well, slowly but surely. So thank you, Irene Camacho Werby, city clerk. Um, this is the beginning of week three. Welcome again. Thank you. Um, so honorable mayor and council members, I am providing the... Um, short hopefully short presentation on the administration department and just a brief overview um, we t basically take a look at last year staff was even though I wasn't here I was um, still busy too uh, but Kathy and Melissa were very busy with the municipal election that occurred on November 6 uh, the city of Calistoga actually had a very high voter turnout close to 75 percent and the Napa County Register of Voters continues to promote the Voters Choice Act, um, which they hopefully look to implement fully in 2020. And again, the Voters Choice Act will allow for all registered voters to receive ballots by mail. Um, it also extends the opportunity um, to cast a ballot as well as um, making it more convenient because not only are there you know drop-off locations that you have to look for or wait to cast or drop your ballot off on election day at the polling location they are coming up with uh, voter centers that allow you to do this weeks and days in anticipation of the election um, and then in addition as well as registering closer to the election date to be able to cast your ballot. If I could just interrupt very quickly just to demonstrate how progressive we, ha we are here in Calistoga. Um, Napa County was one of the first, one of five counties in the entire state of California who initiated full vote by mail for the first time. Calistogans, as part of Napa County, have been vote by mail for a very long time. So the rest of the county is finally caught up to how we do things, uh, and the rest of the state is projected to do so by 2020 so we'll see how that goes so Calistoga blazing the trail showing everyone else how to do it okay. thank you uh, training so staff continues uh, opportunities for continued education uh, we attend annual conferences and trainings because as we all know and learn it's important to remain up to date on new legislation it also provides ideas and a support network for best practices and new trends. Uh, so a big thank you to the City Council for approving the training budgets. Last year, while attending the City Clerk's New Law Conference, I actually had the privilege of listening to now-retired City Clerk Kathy Flamson speak on um, her experience during the 2017 wildfires and advice on best practices, how to prepare for the unexpected. And then in addition to Ms. Flamson, of course, Mayor Canning and City Manager Feek were also present uh, for both of those segments on preparedness tips and personal perspectives. 
uh, both segments again were very well received by all staff, uh, excuse me, by all attendees. Uh, in addition, I have been introduced to the Napa County PIO network, which is um, a committee that meets quarterly, and it's just a group of members of cities, the county, the school district, police, and fire that get together to discuss um, opportunities to um, use tools to help communicate out to the public just information as in, um, excuse me as events occur could you just let people know what PIO, PIO stands for we're PIO acronym is, heavy acron acronym I heavy know. it's a public information officer and oftentimes they look to these agencies the public looks to the agencies for more information and preferably accurate information Staff continues also with their records management, uh, including the records retention and records destruction. Uh, they uh, continue to consolidate documents and box them up um, to keep up with the city's adopted re records retention schedule. Not only does this allow the city to remain compliant, but it also frees up storage space that is oftentimes limited and can be used for other items. Uh, something new for the legislative law, we have SB 1421 in relation to peace officer release of records, which now requires cities to report and release records of any incidents effective January 1 of this year. Um, where police or peace officers are involved in um, misconduct as provided and described in SB 1421. A future projects. So with the ground and running, we have quite a few coming up. Uh, the first one is the California Complete Count Committee 2020 Census. The state has provided the Napa County for its cities to enhance local outreach efforts uh, to support a complete count for the 2020 census. Staff representation from each city will actually be forming a committee to come up with a strategic outreach plan to implement and educate the public and of course encourage participation from all areas but especially those areas that um, normally lack participation. One of my priorities is the paperless agenda system. I'm hoping to get that implemented in live in the next few months. Um, as we all know, a paperless agenda system cuts down on staff time, the cost of full paper production, it's an energy saver, and it definitely provides a quick turnaround time for publishing agenda packets. In <coughs> that is one area we have not been progressive in. <laughs> <laughs> We've been attempting this for several years. I have many different ways I can make this work. Thank you very much. Uh, I also, in addition to the paperless agenda, I will also be looking into uh, providing agendas in Spanish, and hopefully I can provide more information on that in the near future. Um, another option um, or project that we're looking to do is to update the city website. Um, so for 2019, staff goal is pretty much to review the website and see what's working, um, see, visualize and figure out what type of aesthetics we want and we want it to be user friendly for both visitors and residents and hopefully we can get this going live by 2020. Last but not least is the disaster and emergency preparedness. Um, we're always looking at options to, of course, um, just be up to date and figure out, you know, what's working internally and what's not, as well as uh, looking for opportunities to provide training for both disaster and emergency preparedness. Thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate Thank that. You. Council members, any questions? Public, any questions? All right. Thank you. Uh, we will be moving on now to consent calendar. There are two items on the consent calendar. I'll entertain a motion on the consent calendar as presented unless an item is requested to be pulled. So moved. Second. We have a motion by Council Member Krause. We have a second by Council Member Lopez Ortega. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? 
Thank you. Motion carries. There are no public hearings this meeting this evening, so we are moving on to general government. Item number four. Consideration of a resolution rescinding resolution number 2016-004 and approving resolutions adopting certain salary and labor benefits for a three-year term between the City of Calistoga and the unrepresented employee group, approving a budget adjustment not to exceed $47,535 from the unappropriated general fund reserve and $13,200 from the enterprise fund, authorizing the mayor to execute the resolutions and authorizing the city manager to execute agreements with the unrepresented employee group. The recommended action this evening is to adopt the resolution. Taking us through this item will be Gloria Leone, Administrative Services Director. Gloria, welcome back. Or, yes? Or is Dylan taking this? Uh, yeah, I'd, I'd be happy to. The, right. um, the resolution before you, as Council is aware, we've been approving our new labor agreements for uh, most recently Police Officer Association and then the uh, Firefighters Association. Um, we have yet to discuss and finalize the MOU with the uh, Public Employee Association. The item before you today is for what we call the unrepresented group, uh, but it also includes the department directors. So uh, what we've tried to do is we've tried to match uh, wages, benefits, very similar uh, across all of our employees, um, similar to past uh, uh, actions. The council has approved a 4% increase in year one, 3% in year two, 3% in year three. We're basically doing the same thing with this unrepresented group. There are a couple differences that I'd like to point out. So with the staff report, and you've all had a chance to review it, um, our unrepresented employees currently are not receiving longevity pay. That was one of the items that was removed from their uh, salary structure back during the recession. So in a, we, we're offering to bring back longevity pay to this group, small group of employees who are now the only group of employees at the city who don't receive any kind of longevity pay for working at the city. So it's essentially treating them the same as we treat all the other employee groups with the exact same longevity pay plan. Uh, in addition, they had, in, a, in addition to that longevity pay reinstatement, they had asked for a 2% salary increase uh, in year one, 3% in year two, 3% in year three. We actually, uh, looking at the numbers, we increased that, uh, the city's proposal to be 3%. So they would receive 3% in all three years of the term of this MOU. Um, it's more than they originally asked for. It's also slightly less than all the other employee groups are receiving, which is four, three, and three. For Y-rated employees, uh, and for the public who's unaware of what the term Y-rate means, Y-rate means when we do our, our compensation study in, uh, we did it in, did, collected the data in March, released the results to city council in April, or in August, excuse me, uh, when we do the compensation study, we try and peg our employees at what we call the market median uh, of 10 comparator cities plus the city of Calistoga. The reason we do this is we want to make sure that when we are paying a police officer, a maintenance worker, we're comparable to a police officer and a maintenance worker in one of the 10 comparator cities. That way we know that there's some equity. Uh, you could go do the same job in Healdsburg and be making the same, relatively the same amount of money. Now, there's 11 different cities. They all pay a little bit differently. So we try and peg right at that median. We don't want to be at the top. We don't want to be at the bottom. We want to be right in the middle. So that's where we tie our salary structure to. When an employee is Y rated, that means they're above that market median. So rather than you know, try to force a salary reduction on the employee, we simply Y rate them and say, you stay exactly where you're at. Uh, with Y rated employees, we've proposed to offer them a one time, what I'd call a lump sum payment. So they still receive a payment uh, upon a satisfactory performance evaluation, but it looks in the form of a one time lump sum, which doesn't increase their base pay. The reason we do this is it, it one, allows the market to catch up to that employee's pay which is currently above the market, uh, but it also gives us relief on our long-term pension projections for our pension plan. 
gives us a kind of a one-year breathing room uh, and we're not paying that employee above market so any position that is Y rated would basically stay at their Y rated level and would receive a one-time lump sum uh, equal to that 4% pay. Um, one of the things that we are asking in this contract which is similar to the, the requests for all the other contracts is we've learned through recent experience that during an emergency or some kind of major event the city's revenue stream is could be very volatile and there's what I'd call an ability to pay if there was a massive earthquake another wildfire so in each one of our contracts uh, all groups have ag have agreed and, and, and are accepting language that basically reads as follows you can find this uh, on page two at the very bottom last line it's mutually agreed that the city of Calistoga may have limited financial ability to pay future salary increases and such ability is entirely dependent upon the economic conditions that prevail in the community financial impacts related to critical emergency responsive and legislative actions of the state of California recognizing that approximately two-thirds of general fund revenue received by the city as a result of transient occupancy tax collections and that these tax revenues are critically influenced by emergency situations including wildfire flood or other major disaster the following is applied during the term of this agreement in the event there's a 10 percent decline in city transient occupancy tax revenue or should the city be required to exceed 10 percent of general fund expenditure budget excluding CIP expenditures on emergency responses related to a major disaster any remaining subsequent salary increase may be suspended or canceled following a city council declared emergency um, th this was very important language that I wanted to include in all of our contracts where in the event of a major disaster which resulted in reduced tax revenue collections or unforeseen expenses related to that disaster we have an ability to basically hit the freeze button on future salary increases and we're incorporating that citywide to all of our all of our associations um, those are the uh, the highlights of the agreement I'd be happy to answer any questions I certainly want to say thank you to Gloria and our labor negotiator Patrick Clark who I don't believe is here in the building um, once council reviews considers this this uh, <coughs> item we'll have one remaining uh, uh, MOU to address which is with the Public Employee Association which talks remain ongoing in that one be happy to answer any questions all right thank you just a couple quick questions just to help some people who uh, might not be fully aware of this um, please define what the four labor groups are we have the Public uh, Employee Association the Police Officer Association the Calistoga Firefighters Association and the group of unrepresented and miscellaneous employees which is everyone else all right and then you did mention pensions and I know it's a very hot topic across the country and specifically in the state of California if you could please uh, ad address what our current unfunded pension liability situation is because it is far better than most cities currently the city of Calistoga's plan we're at about us uh, that we have several different plans so cumulatively if you looked at everything we're at about 72 percent of our funding level uh, assuming all the current assumptions that CalPERS makes um, we've we've gotten to that point uh, and we'll see future impacts to our funding level when we see the the actuaries take into account the second payment that we made uh, the one million dollar payment that we made uh, in June of, of last year May or June of last year uh, as just a reminder in the last two years alone the city of Calistoga has sent 2.8 million dollars to CalPERS to pay for unfunded pension liabilities and we continue to set money aside for those pension liabilities so we're in a much better position than just a few short years ago thank you very much council members questions of <coughs> city manager yes uh, Dylan uh, after uh, Hugh and I spoke on the phone uh, earlier today uh, I got stopped at CalMart by one of the firefighters uh, who asked about the unrepresented uh, part-time firefighters and uh, I'm sure they're all watching on TV over at the station right now uh, and asked about when their salary was going to be adjusted so uh, perhaps they uh, would like to hear it from you great great question um, we we wanted to get through this MOU 
process the new bargaining agreements which each one with with each of the four groups um, Gloria is already Gloria is already tasked with preparing the part-time wage increases which are typically done uh, as part of the budget process a little bit after so as part of the cough study this year uh, or technically now it's last year um, we included all of our part-time salaries which was the first time we had done that we want to make sure that across the board even for part-time employment we are being we are being competitive and we're offering wages that are fair comparative to the other cities like us and so they can expect to see that here in the coming months once we finalize these agreements and uh, the other statement I'd like to make is since Chris brought up the uh, subject of uh, the CalPERS additional uh, payments on the side fund um, it's important to recognize that about 10 years ago correction about 15 years ago the city did not make CalPERS payments we took a vacation because there was a change in the rules that allowed us to not pay the employer contribution towards CalPERS and the council at that time uh, took advantage of that so I think there's three years that the city did not make a payment on into CalPERS and that's one of the reasons why we're in the position that we're in today there are other reasons as well but if you remove three years of the city's payment uh, our position would be considerably different right now than it is so that is one of the reasons why we have been making the extra payment to CalPERS to retire that debt uh, which is I think the seven seven percent that we're paying on it so it's our highest interest rate all right anyone else questions uh, I think it's a terrific uh, terrific work Gloria that you've done here uh, assembling this you know I'm really impressed with all the information that's here um, and thank you also for uh, responding to my I had half a dozen or so questions she responded uh, to them today which is her first day back at work I haven't been able to process this entirely and so I if there's a fair amount of money involved here for the city to uh, spend and I may be fine with it but um, but for my part I'd need to continue it to the to the next time before I could uh, approve it uh, I may be fine with it but I just need to review this a little bit longer since I just uh, received Loria's responses today any other questions before I open it to the public? About how many uh, employees are in this group? Um, approximate, uh, Gloria, could you answer that? You have, you have the exact 15, number. Fifteen in the unrepresented group. Okay. So we've got a total of about 57 employees full time, so 15 of those are in the unrepresented group. Mm -hmm. All right, anyone in the public with any questions on this item? Mm -hmm. All right. Um, Dylan timing wise or Gloria for that matter um, if we were to continue this to the next meeting uh, to allow for some more time um, does that have any impact obviously this is would all be retroactive anyway if well, if approved what I would what I would request is we just we just continue the item to the next agenda and that way as you had said mayor if we could use the the dates and the times the same that way for the employee for us to continue it to study it out we would still use the same effective date as we would have regardless that means for them financially there's although they'll, they'll still be eligible for the same pay increases whether you approve it tonight or two weeks from now or two months from now whatever you choose um, that would, that would what's, not be what's the date of the next meeting uh, March 5th, March 5th. Uh, Gloria any complications to your universe if we continue this to the next no it just means we've got to look at more information to do <laughs> retroactive pay but it is what it is all right all right what what's the agenda looking like on on the fifth um, as of as of today the forecast agenda was very light okay uh, any objections by consensus to m continuing this to March 5th all right no we, we will do so thank you very much okay. Moving on to item number five, receive a mid-year financial update regarding the fiscal year 2018-2019, the current budget year, uh, and adopt budget adjustments. The recommended action this evening is to adopt the resolution 
Gloria, you'll be taking us through this. Thank you. Yes. Well, thank you, Mayor and um, uh, Council members. <clears throat> thank you. So, my pleasure to present to you the uh, mid-year 1819 uh, budget. We're going to be looking at the uh, updated fiscal year 1718 actuals. Um, we touched on this when um, our independent auditor here was uh, was here, Michael O'Connor. But I'll just refresh your memory on that. Uh, we've got the 1819 adopted budget with adjustments to assumptions uh, through December 31st, 2018, and we're going to look at our major funds: the general fund, the water, the water capital, wastewater, wastewater capital, uh, equipment replacement fund, and the special revenue funds. Uh, for those of you, um, I've given some handouts because I know it's a little bit hard to see everything on the screen. But this is how we ended uh, fiscal year 1718. And again, uh, we spoke to this um, a couple meetings ago. The general fund ended up at 8.275,721, which was about uh, a little less than 200,000 that we had at the beginning of July 2017. Water operations, a little over half a million. Our capital fund, same thing, a little bit over half a million. Our wastewater uh, operations, a little over a million. And our capital, 1.3 million. The equipment replacement fund at 680,000. And our special revenue funds at 8.4 million. So here's what our revenues are, we're projecting for fiscal year 18, 19. Our adopted budget was 11.5 million, and we're adjusting it by a little over uh, $600,000. And some of those uh, adjustments are from the Upper Valley Management uh, franchise fees, uh, from the cleanup of debris, which is about 215,000 when we had the uh, Tubbs fire. There was about 174,000 from insurance proceeds. And just a couple other things, you know, from Parsec. Uh, park and rec fees, uh, Friends of the Pioneer Park, and um, in total, again, a little bit over $612,000. Our transit occupancy uh, tax history, just to show you how we've been doing since way back in 2011-12. Uh, every month since 2011, we've, we've increased our um, TOT with the exception of October 2018 when we had the fire. And so you can see that in the graph how how it dipped down in October. And then also uh, September this month, this year of 2018 and December of 2018, a little bit less in um, TOT than we had in the past. But again, still TOT is strong. At mid-year, uh, we've got 3.4 million already, which is about 54% of our projected revenues. And we've also, uh, staff's recommending some revisions to our expenditures. Uh, approximately $175,022, and this is uh, basically related to uh, labor negotiations with the exception of the CPEA unit, and uh, we had some increases in our uh, liability and property premiums, about 50000 and that increase was due to adding some uh, additional properties and also adding some additional um, insurance. I think we had some uh, flood increases um, that we didn't have in the past. This is our, uh, how we expect to end the year on our sources and uses. You can see uh, the revenues, the expenditures, the transfers in, transfers out, um, the capital projects. And when we first adopted this budget, we had a, um, you can see, let me see if I can see it there, uh, a net fund surplus, a deficit of $1.5 million um, between our revenues and our expenditures that we're revising, uh, we've been, uh, been able to decrease that deficit by 177965 So still a deficit of 1279354 However, with our fund balance of $8.3 million, uh, we're expecting to end the year with uh, almost $7 million at June 30th, 2019. And this just kind of explains a little bit more about um, what our reserves we're expecting um, based on our operating expenditures. Uh, we're projecting a 67.5%. Uh, when we first started the budget, we were projecting 54.5%. Um, but because our fund balance at June 30th, 2018 increased from our projections, now we can see our operating uh, reserves are much higher than they were 
uh, when we came to you at the, at the end of um, June of 2018. Here's the capital projects. Um, a couple of revisions from Public Works, a uh, total of 197,000. And uh, what these have actually been um, approved by City Council in prior um, resolutions and meetings. And the one, the one that's the largest that stands out is our fire station enclosures of 160,000. It was approved um, back a couple of months. So the fire station enclosures is actually not at the fire station. It's the trash enclosures. Trash enclosures at the back, at the back of the, of the fire station. Lot. Okay. <laughs> That's just the way I see it in my head. It's, okay, it's where the fire station's at and it's behind. You are correct. Just my radar always comes on when I see fire department or fire station. So. <laughs> yeah. All right. So um, here's our general fund reserves uh, over the uh, last fiscal years from 2010 to where we're at today, 2019. And you can see we've been um, growing our fund balance since uh, the June 30th, 2016 um, fiscal year. This is our water fund revised. Um, I'm sad to say, you know, our total operating revenues we had to make a large uh, revision there, mainly because um, a couple things, our water revenues have not come out as we had projected. And there was also uh, two projects. The Silver Rose uh, had some single family uh, dwellings occupancy, as well as the Craftsman Inn project were to come on board. And after speaking with the planning and building director, uh, she's not seeing these projects come on, so we're having to make some revisions uh, based on that. Uh, our operating expenditures, not a big, a large of a revision, 34, about $35,000. And based on this, um, we may see now the water fund uh, with the zero uh, balance at the end of um, June 30th, 2019. Uh, let's, uh, I'd like to ask mm -hmm. a couple of questions on this because okay. uh, Total operating revenues, fiscal year 18, 19. Can you pull your mic up, Gary, just for okay. people at home? All righty. Um, I'm rather surprised that we have an almost $900,000 operating revenue revision downwards. Uh, how much of that is a result of us miss, missing the revenue that we were expecting from the increase that we had and how much of that uh, is uh, because of the projects that uh, haven't come online yet. So when the consultant did his um, projections, he had uh, Silver Rose and Calistoga Hills. He had a little bit over half a million um, coming from those two uh, projects in 2018-19. So we had to remove that. And then the other part was from just revenues um, being projected. The fact that we started, um, the rates didn't take effect until May, but we didn't actually start collecting until July 1st of 28, of 29, year we in, 2018, is that correct? Uh, 2018. Okay. So when I did my projections, you know, I came to you in April or May as we're doing the budget. And so revenues, didn't come sooner than I thought they were going to come. So now I've had to make some adjustments for that. Um, water usage also has been down, not as you know high as it has been in the past. Okay. Uh, I'm, I'm sure we're going to belabor this quite a bit more later. We uh, Just some additional items that I'd share with Council. So this was always one of our primary concerns when we, <clears throat> excuse me, when we did the rate study was what happens if rates go up and then behavior changes? So what does that do to consumption? Well, consumption does go down. You know, year to date on you know certain revenue items, so whether it's residential, commercial, um, it, it's up. On other items like on our industrial usage, we're seeing it down. So we've, we contacted our uh, the same consultants we used uh, for the study months ago. We've been reviewing and looking over every bit of data to understand what's going on in addition. One thing that we're doing is we're trying to be, we're also trying to be conservative, both in revenues and expenses. So if you look at our operating expenses, through December 31st, we spent about $1.3 million. But we're leaving it, which is, a, which is almost a third, about a third of the budget we built in for expenses. So we're halfway through the year, we got about a, th a third of the budget. 
So there's, we're leaving in the full amount for our expenses. All of our, you know, vacant positions are fully funded in there. All of our costs, contracts, everything fully funded in there just to make sure we've got everything needed to actually operate the water enterprise. Um, but we don't have the answer yet as to why the revenues are this far off of our forecast. We know that when they anticipated Silver Rose coming online sooner, that had an impact. We know that when we based our revenue forecasts on having more of the year to collect the revenue, when it was delayed through uh, following the public uh, process to, for adopting rates, we knew that was going to have an impact. But we st we can't say here's exactly how much uh, is as a result of, of X, Y, or Z yet. Uh, we're working on it, but for purposes of the budget, we want to revise our budget just to make sure that we're going to be more closely aligned to what we think is actually going to happen by the end of the year. Because I'm... I'm going to be interested in seeing it looks to me like we're going to be continuing to subsidize the water and sewer rates uh, probably substantially uh, going into the future on this well well we don't know for sure yet um, and, and the reason why is because you know when impact fees are paid for example when when silver rose when the the first housing unit gets a certificate of occupancy there's significant one-time impact fees which get paid to the city um, there are other projects which they could come and pull permits for which have been delayed craftsman in for example has all the entitlements but they haven't pulled their permits yet so there there could absolutely be impacts between now and june 30 um, but also we haven't really looked at what what are we going to do right now to curb the cost beyond what we're currently doing um, projects for example you know, Mike has done a good job of sifting through his projects and where can we make sure we've got the funding needed for the projects we're going to complete through the end of year uh, uh, of June 30 but I do still think that there's opportunity for us to manage the budget so that we're in a different position um, but we did know going in that these first few years of our newly adopted water and wastewater increases we had a lot of projects to complete we had cease and desist orders that we needed to comply with we knew we were going to have to spend money up front uh, to address the deferred improvements and some of the mandated improvements we needed to make okay so I guess the short answer is is that we're not going to know what the subsidy from the general fund to the enterprise funds are until probably June 30 or if there will be one we don't know if, if there, there will, will be, be one and if there is going to be one we won't know how much until we get closer to the end of the year all right do we so, have better news hold on <laughs> no, let's let's stay there for a second okay um so on our very light agenda on march 5th i would like assuming the council uh, is not opposed to it I would like the breakout of what makes up the eight hundred eighty seven thousand one hundred and thirty eight dollar revision um, that is a significant amount um, so exactly how much of that was pinned to Silver Rose and in what form is that revenues from water usage or is that um, connection fees etc um, how much of that is pinned to uh, Calistoga Hills which in all of our projections that I recall doing for the last couple of budgets we haven't counted a penny from them uh, projected a penny from them until next fiscal year so I'd like an understanding of what that number is um, you should be able to tell year over year where we're missing on water usage and that impact to revenue right we know how much water was used last year how much is being used this year and then the last piece I'd like is um, I'd like a dollar amount affixed to what the delayed water rate increase what you think that number is that's right I forgot is, we did delay the correct so if the, if the there. council is okay with that direction to staff uh, will that give you you've got two weeks to pull that together I'm assuming that's I'm fine I'm fine with that. I'm okay I, I, I want to know if 
Gloria thinks she can pull it together by then. Well, I was just thinking. Um, You're not planning on vacation for two weeks starting <laughs> today, are you? Or, no, well, do we have the data? The I'm data points <laughs> have to be there. Yeah, I'm just thinking. Um, you know, we won't have uh, February numbers until probably like the first week in March or so, as far as revenues go. And if we're meeting on March the fifth, I think that's our next city council meeting. Well, then just give you know. me a year-to-year -year close of January. Uh, okay. So we'll. That'll be the. The footnote is it does not include February. Okay. So dissect the $887,000 for us, please. Okay? All right. Any other questions from council members on the water fund? All right. Go ahead, Gloria. Thank you. All right. So here's our capital improvement fund. And um, as you can see, our operating revenues, we decreased them by 121260 and that was for the one-time impact fees from the, the two projects, um, Silver Rose and the Craftsman Inn. And we've also uh, decreased our, our capital projects by a little bit over um, half a million, and I will show you on the next slide what those projects are, and our ending working capital would be a zero balance for the water CIP. So um, as uh, city manager mentioned, um, Mike Kern, the public works director, went through all his projects and uh, determined where we could make um, some adjustments. And uh, you see um, quite a few of the projects um, we have been reduced. And in some instances, we eliminated uh, three projects. And the only one I think he increased, let's see. Okay. Oh, he didn't increase anyone. I'm thinking of something else. Um, so again, a reduction of 537,000 are capital projects. So we're now we're down to 2.6 million in capital projects for uh, coming from the water fund. One example, Mr. Mayor and Council, that I just point out is if you look at the bottom of this project, you know, in the budget, and I just want to make sure that we're not, you know, we'll absolutely dissect that $887,000. But if you look at the bottom, here's an example of several projects: um, the generator and transfer switch, the Pope Street generator electric upgrade. Um, several of these projects we built into the budget that were going to be grant funded. So we, 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 we budget both the revenue as well as the expense. And when we peel out the revenue, that's a reason why you might see reduce reductions in revenues. So I uh, just want to point that out that that was also part of this budget process. I, I have a question on that uh, Fiji tank that shows a uh, decrease there. And uh, that, now that's a new uh, facility, I believe. And, how is it that um, that you were able to re, uh, to lower those costs there to adjust on the fees tank? Mike is here, but the project is complete, and so they had they had um, anticipated they were going to spend this much money on it. Okay. But the project has been completed, and these are the revised okay. numbers now based right. on the project being completed. Thank you. Okay. So fa the phage tank, the reduction between the repair, the the two repair lines there of uh, about two hundred and forty thousand dollars is because we had a savings and not because we're not doing something correct correct valve replacement is that because we're not replacing all the valves that we thought we'd replace they just didn't think they'd be completed this year so okay so we are so this is work that's in progress it's perhaps not going to be completed this year Correct. So yeah, I, some, yes. One of the other things that I get worried about is, uh, and we've seen this happen before, that when we don't do these projects, that we have a cost escalator the next year, when everything becomes more expensive next year. Particularly in the area of construction, it seems like the cost increase there <laughs> far exceeds the cost of living. So. And, and we are not. <clears throat> I know this answer, but I want to feel better to get a, an affirmative. We are not putting off, postponing, or n not completing projects required under the cease and desist and or getting to the water quality goals that we have. Correct. Okay. And then just to your point that you made that there are some explanations, we have to make some adjustments, we'll see. I don't doubt you have that data. I want it all on one sheet that shows here's the $887,000 $87, difference, and here's what makes it up. So, okay. 
Thank you. All right, so um, wastewater, the operations fund. So we ended June 30th uh, between uh, the water fund and the, uh, I mean, the wastewater capital and the wastewater operations with a balance of 2.4 million. And we're anticipating with uh, different projects and the reductions that we've made um, to end 2018-19 uh, with the zero, uh, zero balance on um, the capital improvement, but half a million on the operations fund, as you can see, 576,210. Um, not very, ma very many revisions here to the operating revenues, uh, more on target here than um, what we had anticipated. And our expenditures were so far only 15,624 in adjustments. Our capital improvement project, uh, the reduction in, in revenues, 423,893, again, is due to one-time impact fees and the two projects that uh, are anticipated not to come on board. And we've reduced um, our capital projects by uh, $354,146, which you can see here, uh, the projects that have been reduced by the public works. Um, there is one project where they did increase, and that's the Palisades lift station. Um, that is coming to be a more expensive project than they had anticipated at the beginning of the year, so they've increased it by 150000 um, But they, like I said, they've decreased some of their other projects. They didn't feel that they were going to uh, be able to complete uh, this year, and also because of the one-time impact fees not coming in, they decided which ones um, they could do without this year. <coughs> Can I, can I just real quick, Gloria, yes. um, one item I just want to point out to City Council. If you look uh, almost to the very bottom, we're, we're striking a $350,000 item out of the budget. Um, if you remember, uh, we entered into a contract to remove uh, the this, this solids in our aeration basins. We have two very large basins, and we removed approximately 90 tons of solids that had been sitting in those basins for nearly two decades. Uh, what that amount of solid does, it looks like just sloppy mud, is it prevents our aerators, which are basically oxidizing all of that suspended waste in those aeration basins. It's preventing them from, uh, from the, the, the bugs in the water to latch on to the debris in the water and start separating it. So it's, it's, a, it's a problem for us, essentially, to have 90 tons of mud in those areas preventing those, <clears throat> that oxygen from freely moving back and forth. It's also one of the reasons that we had to run our three blower motors constantly, 24-7, to move air through those aeration basins. Since we've removed that sludge uh, and got everything out, We've, we're, ex we're already seeing significant reductions in just our energy usage alone. They can now even tamper down from three blowers down to two, and perhaps one day down to one blower. Uh, but also removing everything out of there, it, it moves much more freely. Because that solid is now out of those uh, aeration basins, and we're working very diligently to try and keep uh, uh, silt uh, and, and the, the mud, if you will, out of the plant, uh, Mike Kern felt it was appropriate to take this grit removal project out of the budget for right now to help us address the more critical need, which is the Palisades lift station, which we've already been out to and we've designed. We're getting ready to open bids uh, this Thursday. Is that sludge, is that sludge <coughs> removal a... Um an ongoing maintenance issue, or is it a design flaw with the catch basin, or is that something we'll always have to be working on? Um, we always should be working on it. Um, there's different ways to do it, but also the city never funded the operations of the plant to the extent that we could go do that work, uh, nor did we fund the capital improvements needed, like a grit chamber, to catch all of that solid before it even gets into the plant. So um, what we're doing is more of a, you know, it's, it's not the best long-term approach for a, there's, there's infrastructure you could build which would have a much better approach. But right now, it's clean, it's aerated, 
you know, even even having annual or semi-annual contracts for someone to come out and clean that for us would be much better uh, to keep it in the state that it's in today. All right, Gloria. Okay. Uh, so now we've got the equipment replacement fund. Uh, not a, a whole lot of revisions here from our, our adopted budget. Um, 3,000 additional operating revenues and uh, 49,150 um, additional operating ex um, on ex operating expenditures. The one thing that you will see is the net of transfers. We made a $300,000 um, adjustment, and that was for the uh, fire station uh, vehicle. Uh, that 300000 is coming from the, the fire, the one-time fire uh, fee impact fund. So um, I think the only thing difference was, you know, what our projected uh, ending um, balance uh, was going to be, or our beginning working capital was going to be at 2018-19. Um, it was projected at 713,441, but when we ended the year, it went down to 679,454. So now we're projecting a 555,000 um, budget. Of course, um, for that fire station uh, vehicle, 200,000 is coming from our equipment replacement fund. And you can see here the adjustments that are being made. Um, we had to replace uh, the AC unit at the police station. Uh, we had some savings from a mower that we had um, budgeted as well. Some, uh, we just eliminated some chargeable signs uh, for this year. And then there was um, a rim server. We're going to have to replace that at the fire station, so we're putting that in. And then there's um, two vehicles that had been brought to your attention back in December when we brought the uh, leasing program. Unfortunately, um, it was my error that I didn't include him in our um, uh, uh, equipment replacement fund. So I will be uh, adding those two adjustments at our next time that we meet um, with our, any um, revisions to our budget. But I just want to point that out that those um, should be there. I just didn't include them. What's the impact of that? So it's about it's about eighty five thousand. I'm I'm trying to get numbers from the chief as to how much he's going to spend, but the funding is is basically going to come from three places: uh, abandoned vehicle, the asset forfeiture, and the cops funding. So none of that's really actually coming from the equipment replacement fund. So it's coming from our our special revenue funds. All right. Okay. And here's our special uh, revenue funds. Um, again, there's a couple of. Um, adjustments uh, one of them is um, let's see we've got some measure T um, monies about 167,365 um, already through December 31st which we weren't anticipating so that's included now in our, our revenues um, and then our expenditures we've um, made some revisions on some of our um, special revenue funds and then the other thing also in our revenues We've also making an adjustment of 179199 uh, to the housing fund for the proceeds of the 1% uh, Measure D for the affordable and workhouse uh, housing uh, projects that may come up. And um, here's our, our capital projects. Uh, basically, what we had adopted at uh, the beginning of the year, the only two things that we, one item that we've added is the EV charging station, which is brought to your consideration um, about a month ago in December, or a month and a half in December. And that's being funded uh, 13000 by a TDA grant and then 3000 from the general fund. And here's pretty much the wrap-up of the revision of all of our funds. Again, general fund, uh, about $7 million. Our enterprise funds, with the exception of the wastewater treatment uh, operations, are at zero balance uh, wastewater treatment. Uh, a little over half a million, and then our equipment replacement fund, a little bit over half a million, and our special revenues at 8.7 million. So that pretty much wraps up our mid-year um, budget adjustments. And so if you got any questions, uh, we're happy to answer those. Council members, questions? On our uh, projected end fund balance, 630.19, call it $7 million. Not all of that is spendable, correct? 
usually what happens at the end of the year, um, you'll have uh, prepayments. You've got some accounts receivable that are out there, so that money's kind of frozen at the moment. It usually runs about a, about a million dollars every at the end of each year. Okay, so if we were to back that out, we'd have about six million mm -hmm. in there, and that is what percent then would that be of our general fund for reserve? Sixty-seven point five. Mayor's pretty smart. I just did that math in my head, Gloria. Okay. It was oh. on your other page. It was on the other page. You just did turn. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> if you were to if you were to back out though about a million dollars, yeah. you'd go down about ten percentage points. So it'd be about fifty seven and a half right. or so. Okay. Still at our goal. Other questions. All right. So uh, I'll open it to the public for any questions in a moment. Um, Obviously, water and sewer, the enterprise fund, sensitive subject around here, sensitive topic around here. Uh, the headline is not that $887,000 is lost or overspent. There are adjustments up and down that are going to need to happen. The overall impact is 887. You're going to come back to us with the breakout of all of that so that we can get warm and fuzzy about where that is. All right. Um, Mr. Harkin, the lights, please. Uh, anyone in the public have any questions for staff regarding the mid-year review and adjustments of your budget? Just to lighten the mood, we're still in a very good financial place, relatively speaking. All right, no one else? All right, I'll close public comment. We'll move on to item number six, consideration of discussion of the Napa County Draft water quality and tree protection. Did I skip something? Um, did oh, you want me to? Yes. Do you actually? Sorry. Yep. <clears throat> the recommended action this evening on that item, item number four, sorry, was to adopt the resolution for the mid year budget adjustments. So moved. Second. We have a motion by Council Member Krause. We have a second by Council Member Williams. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you very much. Thanks for catching that, Dylan. Sorry. Uh, item number six, consideration of a discussion of the Napa County Draft Water Quality and Tree Protection Ordinance. The recommended action is to provide comments on draft ordinance. ordinance. Taking us through this item will be City Manager Feek. I apologize. Lynn, Lynn had to take care of a family matter down in Southern California, so I wanted to make sure she had a chance to do that. No problem. Um, <clears throat> as, as we all know, the... Uh, Napa County government has been going through some uh, ordinance uh, making and uh, preparing items as part of a response both to the Measure C item on the ballot last November, but also as part of their uh, three-year strategic plan process that they've been going through for the last several months. Um, at our last council meeting, we had a resident come and present uh, a paper to the city council asking us to consider uh, if the city of Calistoga should provide any input to what the county is about to undertake uh, at planning commission tomorrow, but then at future board of supervisors meetings related to what's called the water quality and tree protection ordinance. So I'm not going to go into uh, full breadth and detail on what the ordinance is other than to say you can see a copy of it uh, as attachment one in your council agenda packet. Um, also, the county has done a very good job, I believe, of, of making this very accessible on the county's website. If you go to Napa County Government's website, you can see a link to this ordinance and you can see all of their relevant documents that they're reviewing, including maps, uh, red line versions, clean ver everything you might want to see about this. Um, the, count, the Board of Supervisors uh, uh, routinely looks at their environmental regulations and has made frequent updates over the past several years, um, always seeking you know, a constant update to these conservation regulations. Uh, particularly what this ordinance does is, is attempts to improve requirements for stream setbacks to better protect riparian habitat uh, and water quality within the county. Um, <clears throat> When you look at the different things that this ordinance does, I want to hit just some of the bullet points or the highlights just to make sure the public is aware. Um, these new ordinances uh, would prohibit new planting structures on slopes with over 30% uh, with certain exemptions. It also, and this is how it would affect the city of Calistoga, it would create a buffer of 200 feet around municipal reservoirs, which essentially means nothing goes in that buffer zone to protect that watershed area. Um, subject to comment from cities about specific reservoirs. 
would adopt the federal definition of wetlands but monitor the state's process and consider adoption of a final state definition of wetlands. It also would create a 50-foot minimum setback around wetlands, would preserve the existing definition of stream and amend the, um, the county code to include a Class three equivalent stream. It would create a 35-foot minimum setback from Class three equivalent streams. It would also increase the tree canopy retention from 60% to 70% and extend it from development in municipal reservoir watersheds to development in all unincorporated areas. This is one of the greater changes in the ordinance uh, proposal. It would extend a 40% shrub canopy retention requirement for development in municipal watershed reservoirs to development in all unincorporated areas. It would exclude grassland retention outside of municipal watersheds. It would also increase the tree mitigation ratio from two to one to three to one, which is similar to the cities. It would also prioritize mitigation to the highest biological value, preferably on-site, but allow off-site, and allow mitigation on slopes greater than 30%, but not in stream setbacks. It would exempt reconstruction of structures lost to declared emergency events. It would also exempt uh, five acres of vineyard development on slopes less than 15% from the new ordinance requirements with the limit of once per legal lot. <clears throat> One item that's not specifically stated in here is it also continues to exempt, I'll call it wildfire mitigation activities. So for creating fire, uh, fuel breaks, barriers to protect life, uh, it, it allows for exemptions there. Uh, particularly when the city is initiating it and also relative to um, existing legal conforming structures uh, that are present. <clears throat> the purpose the following ordinance provisions may be specifically relevant to the city of Calistoga, which as I had mentioned earlier, the 200 foot setback, uh, but also the, um, the increase from 60% to 70%, the tree canopy cover. Um, Kimball Reservoir, which is one of the city's water sources, specifically identified in conservation regulations as a sensitive domestic water supply. The reservoir is located on a 278 acre parcel outside the city limits, as you all know, a map is attached. Um, then we did confirm with the county staff <clears throat> that any activities on that property for a municipal purpose are exempt from the county code, including this ordinance. Um, however, there are portions of the Kimball Reservoir along the southern boundary, uh, are, which are separated from the adjoining property line by only about 20 feet. One of the recommendations staff, uh, Lynn Goldberg, has suggested is that we request a minor modification that just simply states, in the event the adjoining property line is closer than 200 feet to the municipal water supply, that the 200-foot setback is measured from the adjoining property line, which essentially just makes sure that they still aren't constructing anything within that 200-foot setback, whether you measure it from our property or from their property, it specifically would be from their property. Um, <clears throat> at this point, the county is prepared to begin discussions at their planning commission level tomorrow. Uh, and so we, we are happy to uh, provide any comments, feedback on behalf of the city uh, from a policy nature. Um, city staff has not been uh, well attuned to this. This is county staff uh, developing their ordinance for uh, the county. But we wanted to make sure that if there were impacts to the city of Calistoga, government, particularly related to Kimball Reservoir, that we were aware. that we don't see any significant uh, discernible impacts to the city operations at this time. So I'd be happy to answer any questions, uh, take any comments from the council. Thank you. Council members, questions? Um, I appreciate, um, Bill, and your suggestion or staff suggestion to um, move that property, uh, respect the, um, the uh, reservoir from 200 feet from the property line rather than just the reservoir itself. Um, I'd actually rather be more aggressive in defending our reservoir. Um, the suggestion that uh, Mike Hackett brought last week, last meeting, was for a 500-foot minimum setback of the reservoir for many development. And I think, um, I think that makes sense. I think we can suggest that, recommend that. Um, it's our reservoir, our water. The sentiment that uh, flows into it from development is an issue. I was at the uh, WICC, the Water uh, Commission down in Napa, and the biologist, uh, Mr. Kohler, reported uh, that as for the river's health, there still are Chinook and Steelhead, but it's not a healthy run. It's not terrible, but it's bad, um, relating, uh, referring to the, the river itself and the 
uh, quality of the water that's going down. And then uh, Mr. Hackett sent me a, an email uh, referring to the city of Yontville and its reservoir. The lead technician at the water treatment plant mentioned that recent spikes in turbidity related to new vineyard projects there were a concern as water users, concern for Yontville, as water users foot the bill for more expensive treatment and systems repair. So I think, I think we can afford to recommend to the county that we, um, that we be more aggressive in defending the, uh, the reservoir that's, that's here. 200 foot is, is a good start, and I like your idea of a little, far, a little more than that, but I think we can do the, um, the uh, greater setback, at least recommend that as a, as a city. Do we, have we, um, Dylan, do we know if staff has overlaid of what a 500 foot setback would look like and if there's anything that falls within that? I mean, on our map here, that's the 200, right? We, city staff has not. When you look at surrounding the reservoir itself, um, measured from the reservoir, the edge of the reservoir, we don't see a discernible impact. We reviewed this several months prior. Uh, when Measure C was still an active conversation before the election. Um, so I don't see a, a significant impact. Um, when reached out to the county, which, which obviously has done a lot more research, they presented some time ago at the county level the difference between a 200-foot setback and a 500-foot setback. At least according to the literature that the county was reviewing, they did not see a discernible impact. That's why the county staff recommended the 200-foot. Um, I can't speak to that. I wasn't there, didn't participate, but that was the response from uh, David Morrison from Napa County. Um, when you look at our reservoir, so much of it is steep hillside. There is a, a significant amount of it on city property, um, and there's a lot of uh, steep terrain that would be very difficult for you know vineyards development to happen and occur up there. Um, you know, it's important that we get to provide comments. Uh, I, I'm not sure what the slopes are. I have not reviewed that data myself, but um, uh, I, I would I would perceive that the most significant uh, concerns, if any, would be on that south southwest. I guess it's it's actually the kind of the the, the west western, western edge, edge of the reservoir itself. I'm encouraged to uh, suggest the 500 foot setback also by the. Uh, vote here in Calistoga on Measure C, which encompassed, you know, lots of the water and woodlands issues. But in, in general, um, Calistogans seem to favor um, a greater respect rather than a lesser uh, respect for the, the woodlands, the water, and so on. So that uh, the vote was uh, fairly strong for C. Um, and in that spirit, I think, uh, I feel emboldened to, to recommend something uh, more aggressive. Just a clarification question. Did and I'm not familiar with the Measure C language. Did Measure C include a setback requirement? I don't. I don't, I don't, don't believe it did. No, not for the reservoirs. For the streams, it did. Correct. Yeah. For the so, reservoirs, I don't think so. So the, the 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 idea of including the 200 foot for the reservoir was more. My understanding is that was more related to existing 200 foot buffer uh, f related to septic systems in the county. So I think they were just trying to keep it close to other enforcement items that the county does uh, deals. So if if we look at the reservoir map, uh, exactly to your point um, earlier on the western edge of our reservoir, which is what's closest to our property line. Um, I mean. If you took a rough look at that, having been up there before, I think that all of that would be exempt from any kind of vineyard development anyway because it violates a couple of other requirements in what's being proposed to the county. So you couldn't actually put vineyard in that area uh, because of the slope requirements. Uh, now that's an untrained eye looking at it, um, but I'm sure we must have some sort of, especially after the fire mitigation we just went through, um, perhaps some sort of slope plans to look at um, that so it could very well you know, 
I'm not opposed to it, Don, but it could very well be a moot point because you can't maybe, get you can't get within moot. 500 feet anyway. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And it may be as much in the, in the sending a message to uh, Napa County that we're really concerned about this, uh, the whole climate issue, and more specifically the mm -hmm. water for us. Um, as a practical matter, it may not make much difference for us. Yep. But um, but Calisoga message wise, yeah, yeah. But to send that message uh, to to tell them that yeah we think this is important it doesn't cost us anything there's no financial implication here but it does uh, speak to the spirit of a, of a greener and a more climate sensitive community uh, asking for or requesting uh, a greater setback uh, than uh, than they're suggesting. Dylan, do you know who the property owner is to our west of the reservoir? Um, I don't personally. Will um, okay. Staff will know. Okay. Uh, so let's. What I would like to say with regard to that is uh, uh, I understand that the 200 foot number came based on some uh, data that they had about uh, the ability of the ground to avoid siltration of the uh, of the reservoir and uh, you could be right that for our purposes 200 feet or 500 feet might not make any difference because of the type of terrain that we have there. However, uh, it may make a difference for St. Helena, for Yontville, and for Napa uh, to have the 500 feet. So I think um, our support of going to 500 feet uh, might be something that the other jurisdictions would appreciate. So uh, I'd be willing to recommend 500 feet if that's what the recommendation is of the other cities and just to be supportive of, of their position. Again, I'm assuming that 500 feet may not be essential for us because we own, you know, two thirds of the land around it already. So that's just my feelings on it. I do uh, believe that it is a, it's an issue in the city of Napa the 200 versus 500 um, in terms of uh, what their concern is so yeah and my my thinking on that would be to uh, send them our recommendation as a city we think this is important and then it's up to the supervisors to put it all together and they'll respond to those other cities and whatever whatever they uh, they want as well but at least up valley if we say 500 feet we're sending that message that we think this is important and uh, it'll be up to the supervisors to put it all together are council members comfortable with that? Yep. Okay. Uh, anything else we want to address on this document before I open it to the public? All right. Anyone in the public wishing to address this matter? Yes, sir. Should you so choose, please share with us your name and your address and limit your comments to a maximum of three minutes. And you got another wonderful haircut, sir. Oh, well, I just got tired of sitting. No, anyway, uh, McNay, 2653 Foothill Boulevard. <clears throat> uh, what I, I see this ordinance, and it, I guess it's basically just writing the coattails of the county ordinance. Is that is that what this is it about? It is the county ordinance. This is the county ordinance. We've okay. been asked by the county to weigh in on it. I see. We're not creating our own. Well, what is this that you're going to approve, the city of Calistoga? The, was, the, the city of Calistoga is just providing comments to the county okay, on their so ordinance. The comments. They're Correct. beginning their formal process tomorrow. So what I would like to know, who is going to enforce this ordinance? That would be the county. The county? The county. And uh, is that Diane Dillon going to come up here and ride herd on us or what? <laughs> uh, however the county normally enforces well, their actions. the city of Calistoga has made ordinances and I can verify they haven't been enforced. So who's going to enforce this ordinance? And it looks like to me that initially this pretty much belongs to the Forest Service, the Army Corps of Engineers, and the Coast Guard. Cow peas in a creek. Coast Guard comes running out, wants to know why that happened. So <clears throat> and the county thinks they're going to take that over, right? So the, the ordinance that the county is considering is applicable only to the land that the count that it falls within the county's jurisdiction. Okay, so uh, we have to. They've asked all the cities to weigh in because clearly cities. Um, 
spill into or their activities spill into, as is the case with our reservoir, into okay, county jurisdiction. Okay, you're cutting into my three minutes. I, I'm, I'll give you some. Oh, okay. <laughs> anyway, I was wondering what a wetland is actually. What is that definition? S so there's a couple different definitions we've Is it like learned. the Napa River? So there's a federal definition, there's a state definition, and I believe the county, if I heard you correctly, Dylan, the county is adopting the federal definition, as long as it, it is not in conflict with the state definition. Okay. Hold on. We're, we're, we'll get to that. So fortunately, unfortunately, it references uh, the California, one of the codes of regulations, 33 CFR 328.3. But in the county ordinance, it will read, a wetland means those areas that meet either the federal definition of wetlands as set forth in this code, which I apologize, that was not a state, that was a federal code, as that section may be amended from time to time, or the state of California definition of wetland is adopted by the State Water Resources Control Board as a state wetland definition, as that definition may be amended from time to time. In the event of a conflict between the state or federal definition, Whichever definition is more protective shall control. And the reason they do that is definitions are updated in state and federal canon all the time. So when we're trying to marry our ordinance up to a federal or state definition, we just reference that section of code. Would the city would do it the same way? I still haven't got a definition. When you look is at this, is it a river? Is it a creek? Is I can tell salt? you that if there is a, if there is even an itty bitty ounce of water that flows through it, like so perhaps the the ditch behind the the train cars over near the merchant property, that's classified as a wetland. Okay, good. That's what I wanted to know. So, does that include existing buildings or just new construction? Well, the wetland is related to the waterway, so I'm not quite sure how they're going to interpret it as far well, as development for near wetlands. There's water in the Napa wetlands. River, and there's houses right on top of the Napa River banks on each side. They're within 50 feet. Do we have to remove those? No, no. These or just are not build new ones? Correct. Yeah. It's different. The setbacks for reservoirs are different than the setbacks for riverway, riverways, waterways, streams, etc. Well, the reason I'm asking, because it affects the 47 acres across the street from me, as far as new construction goes. Because there's a retention pond and a river. Right. So that, that's why I wanted to know. That's fair enough. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? <laughs> Dennis, we did all of that. Your question, my interruption, the reading of the ordinance in four minutes and 17 seconds. Oh, right. Nicely done. <clears throat> um, anyone else on this topic? All right, we'll bring it back to uh, the council. Any further direction we'd like to give in terms of feedback? So we would be supportive of a 500 foot setback specific to reservoirs for the Board of Supervisors consideration. All right, anything else you need from us, Dylan, on that one? All right, thank you. Moving on to item number seven, consideration of discussion by request of Council Member Williams regarding council agenda formatting, organization, and publication. The recommended action is to provide direction. Taking us through item number seven will be Irene. Welcome back, Irene. Your second presentation in one in your second meeting, right? Does that mean I'm done for the year? No, uh, no. If you are, that means we are. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, Mr. Harkin, could you kill the lights for us, please? Oh, Thank you. It's okay. Irene Camacho Orby, a city clerk. Yes, so uh, Honorable Mayor and Council Members, for tonight we have the discussion item of the agenda format, um, which includes the entire formatting, organization, and publication as brought forward by Council Member Williams. So based on the areas specified for discussion, I took the liberty to not only provide a few samples from other cities, but also provide a little bit of background on what the city is required to provide, as well as just a few recommendations. Uh, so we'll start with um, the standard language mechanics, um, or in other words, in the headers and titles for the subject line and staff reports. Um, I researched multiple cities and found that pretty much across the board they have different formats for providing the subject information line on their reports um, and I provided a, three examples here so on the first example we see that the subject line 
um, the whole line is actually bold, but the first word only is capitalized. In example two, we see that the subject line is both bold and all in caps. And then in the third example, we see that the subject line only has the first word capitalized, which currently matches what the city is currently using. Um, I will mention, though, however, that as documents are posted to the website, um, just that we remain cautious on the type of format that we use, even though we can use any. Um, people with limited vision often use reading or recognition software that pulls the text from the web content. Um, so though again, though not required, the headings and titles with either all caps or capitalization of each word is often preferred just because the software will in turn identify this as a heading or title and then read it back to the user. Can you pause on that one? Yes. Thank you. So the question or concern you had, Councilmember Williams, uh, on the formatting. Yes. It it uh, relates to it relates to um, all capitals to begin with okay. all capitals uh, I'm looking at the city of Calistoga agenda and this is not a big item all of us can we can follow the agenda if it's all capitals but um, my object here is to um, encourage participation by the public <coughs> rather than uh, present obstacles to the uh, to the readers and um, a paragraph that's all capitalized is not standard, not standard English. It's not standard usage. And it certainly can be read, but it is a little bit, it's a, it's a beginning difficulty in following the agenda. So it's a small suggestion, but using a more standard English, which employs a capital at the beginning of the sentence mm -hmm. and then non-capitalized words otherwise, uh, I think would be helpful to um, to folks who may not be following the agendas, you know, we get used to it, seeing them all the time. But uh, folks who are coming to it maybe for once a year, it's a little bit of a an obstacle, and so it's a small suggestion as far as that goes. Okay, and uh, to your uh, Irene, the recognition software for the visually impaired was there an opinion we've received on? whether ours is helpful or hurtful to that type of software or? Uh, no, ours seems to be working because each of the words, it's not full caps, um, but each of the words is, cap. the first letter of each word is capitalized, which so pulls it as okay. a title or heading. Okay. So as long as we don't go full caps, right, which that complicates we, which the software. Which we can, but, you know, again, to the eye, like Mr. R excuse me, Councilmember Williams was saying, maybe it's not as easy to read okay. visually. All right, can we go on to the next topic, please? Posting of agendas. So as we all know, the um, minimum requirement for posting the agendas per the government code 54950 is 72 hours for all regularly scheduled meetings. Um, in just doing a little bit of research for the four-day publication prior to a meeting is, I believe, definitely a reasonable amount of time. Um, this occurs a great deal when council meetings are actually sc scheduled later in the week, I found, either on Wednesdays or Thursdays, as most cities prefer to get their packets out before the weekend, and that way they're already pushed to that four- to five-day window ahead of time. Um, another item that I found is oftentimes as a popular practice in those cities which are closed either every Friday or every other Friday already limits their time frame to publish agendas on Thursdays instead, again pushing it to that four to five day window. In researching the um, seven or more days prior, I did find that some cities actually publish a preliminary agenda, uh, usually between 10 and 12 days prior to a regularly scheduled meeting, except with the preliminary agenda, there are no staff reports included because then those cities will actually turn around and publish a final agenda 
at least five days prior that include the staff reports. Um, another is the seven day publication can be seen or seven or more days can be seen in larger cities which have multiple staff across departments or if the council specifically chooses to update their own policy on the preparation of the agenda and conduct of meetings. Um, I will, however, let the council know that should the city council choose to update the policy regarding the agenda and conduct of meetings, a resolution will actually have to be brought forward at the next meeting to rescind the, current, the city's current resolution lastly adopted in 91, which um, specifies that the agendas will be prepared on the Friday before the meeting. So we'll just have to officially adopt a new policy if that's the direction the council chooses. Certainly not an insurmountable problem. <laughs> um, so let's address this one before we move on. Currently, so, and this will be a staff question. So meetings are on Tuesday. Packets go out on Friday. If we were to ask for a seven-day window, so the Tuesday prior for publication, what kind of complication, what does that do to your, your world? Other than the fact that we're clearly staff recommendations, staff reports, et cetera, would have to be prepared in advance of that. Um, Workflow-wise, what does that look like? Um, <clears throat> when we spoke at the department director meeting, all it essentially does is it requires staff to just do a little bit more pre-planning up front. There are a lot of times where we're not getting comments back until you know, the, the deadline date, whenever that is. Currently, because it's Friday, we may not get those final staff reports until Thursday, perhaps even Friday morning. So if we push the deadline date you know, back uh, so we, we give a larger window of time that it's published, all that it essentially does is forces everybody to get everything in before that date. So I think initially there's a there's a response, a little bit of an impact, um, but that's just the new date. Uh, and it's I think it's fairly easy for us to adapt to it. Um, there are sometimes items where we might not get a, you know, it's it might be a, <clears throat> you know, if there's a, a weekend, you know, a lot of times we see a holiday on a Monday. So you might have an impact there where following holidays we might see a little bit more of an impact, but again, it just requires us to look at the calendar, prepare a little bit more in advance, which we are currently doing a, uh, a forecast agenda. That was one of the items discussed at our council retreat last year. We've been doing that since and even trying to expand it and, and it, at each one of our weekly meetings asking super, uh, department heads what's, what's out there, what's coming. That way we can at least let people know what the, what the topic is going to be even if the staff report's not done yet. So I don't foresee a significant impact on this one. It's really more a matter of What's the council's preference on when they get it? Okay. Councilmember Williams. Uh, I appreciate that input very much. That is good research. And the staff does a great job uh, on preparing these agendas, you know, you and the rest of the staff. So I'm, I really do appreciate that. Um, and I'm mainly thinking <coughs> of the, um, well, I'm thinking of us a little bit. Uh, but you folks and my colleagues here are used to dealing with the four day uh, preparation time. However, uh, for the public, uh, the more time the better and sometimes things aren't on the radar until they show up on the agenda and seven days is almost twice as much time for the public if it wants to to review study explore or ask questions about an agenda item so I think the public um, would be encouraged to do that they would feel more um, knowledgeable um, staff has been working on these topics for months or weeks anyway as they come along but um, for some of the public, it's maybe the first time. And so uh, seven days <coughs> is my suggestion because it allows at least a week after the previous meeting for, um, for uh, staff to prepare the agenda for the next one. And it does give the public a full week as well. So it's sort of splitting the difference between meetings. And if meetings are farther apart, then staff has even more time than, than seven days to prepare. And the public still has at least seven. When I was at... Uh, City Council School uh, a few weeks ago up there in Sacramento, uh, I asked <coughs> colleagues uh, around the state um, how far in advance of the meeting was the agenda issued for their town. And uh, for many of them, it was four days, just like what we do. And for some of them, it was five and six and seven days. And the winner 
was our neighbor next door in St. Lena. Their agenda is issued 11 days before the meeting. Um, so they uh, allowed that much time for the public. Uh, but I can see the logistics involved here at staff. Sometimes that would only give staff three or four days to prepare from the previous meeting. So seven days seemed like a good compromise uh, that way as far as um, giving the public more time to look at uh, what's coming up. And I like your idea, by the way, of, uh, of uh, issuing the topics ahead of time, too. You know, if that, if that can be done, that's a, that's a great idea, even if they're not uh, elaborated on by the public, uh, by the discussion. So, um, so it's mainly uh, for the sake of the public and that they have more time to explore and review and comment on eventually knowledgeably on the topics that are uh, coming up. If, if, if it's, sorry, go ahead, Dylan. Just, just one comment that just occurred to me is currently both of our local newspapers have publication deadlines of Tuesday and Wednesday. Uh, so what we try to do is we try to feed them a forecast agenda. Here's the topics, might answer questions before that uh, those publications occur later in the week. But if it was moved up to a Tuesday, that would be another ancillary benefit is we could have a published agenda for both pub local publications prior to their publication deadlines. I, would, uh, I wouldn't have opposition to this. It gives people more time, the public more time can go to the papers, as you said. And oftentimes when we publish on a Friday, while residents are looking at this, we're closed on Saturday and Sunday. There's nobody to ask questions to. And in this case, on Monday. And, and some, yeah, exactly. To, uh, the good example of this uh, would be Monday. So unless there is a significant impact to um, staff's ability to do so, but that's just my opinion. Council Member Lopez Ortega. I, I think this um, having more time is a great idea because also, um, you know, as Donald say. Um, the public will be uh, had time to review the agenda and if they had any comments. I think what we will be ideal is to have um, the residents of Calistoga be more involved in, and come more often to our meetings. Uh, so I think having more time will be great. Give them twice as much time, right? Yes. <laughs> Council Member Kraus. Uh, I like the idea of having more time with the agenda. The example of yesterday being a legal holiday is, you know, I had questions that I needed to ask about agenda items. And uh, there is a staff meeting that occurs Tuesday morning before the, and so if I have a question about something that's on the agenda and I call in the morning, oh, Dylan is in a staff meeting. so. I don't get the answers until the afternoon sometimes. Uh, so I, I like the idea of having the agenda earlier. However, one of the complaints that sometimes we hear is that the speed with which the city can respond to something is uh, sometimes you know, God, it's a bureaucracy, and you know you got to have things done. And if you don't have it done by then, it goes two more weeks before you, or three more weeks in some cases before uh, things get uh, put on the agenda. So, I, I guess, and this would be a question for the city clerk: um, if we have, uh, let's say, there's, uh, we want to have this thing out uh, on Thursday before the uh, council meeting. Um, or maybe Thursday morning or something like that. Um, uh, and let's say Friday something Friday morning something comes up that's uh, very important, like um, we need to authorize a contract to get something done, and you know we have a small window of time to do it. Uh, is it possible to issue a revised? Uh, city council agenda and staff report without as long as it's considered an emergency item then yes we could do a revised agenda or we can even do a, it, or you can even add it at the meeting um, when, when we've done emergencies before um, and that's been rare mm -hmm. uh, usually there has to be a council meeting in which we say yes this is any emergency item. Um, uh, 
and I'm not so sure that everything we might want to need to do, for instance, there might be a bid that's about to run out or we got a special deal on a street sweeper or something uh, that requires us to respond quicker. The, the, I believe where that would be covered, and if I go afoul, you'll tell me, is uh, uh, the mayor is actually entitled to call for an emergency meeting with at least 24 hours notice as long as we publish the agenda. So if we ran into something like that, then you could, I could call for, the mayor could call for uh, an emergency meeting, which would be either a revision to the current or a bolt on to the current. So I, I think that's how we would catch that. Okay. Like I say, I, I think we need to be a little more nimble than having a longer lead time uh, on things. But uh, something really funny that I said, ma'am? Um, so we'll, we'll uh, propose seven days? I propose seven days, okay. yes. I propose that. I understand it may take, you know, some some months to make that adjustment. You know, that may not happen. We have to do the resolution. Mm -hmm. uh, an example, I'm sorry to kind of cut you off, but just an example was earlier tonight when we talked about uh, providing some additional feedback related to the budget. And the breakdown of, of you know where those revenues have gone, why it's been amended. So for just practical purposes, you know, Gloria's task now to go back, let's go dig through this, and she's got basically a week's time. Because a week from today, we have to have a staff report written, possibly a resolution, possibly other documents, contracts, whatever it have you, uh, that needs to be ready for publication. So I do think there's going to be, uh, I'm going to call it a, just the expectation that, you know, I give my department directors, but we need to be clear with council on what our turnaround time is up front. Because, you know, if, if we're getting direct feedback from council in this meeting, we realistically would have one week's time, less than one week's time to have that back to council before that publication date. So what we can work to make it happen. I think there will just be a learning curve to do it. All right, and you just make us aware of that when we do that. Um, so to take back, um, obviously a resolution is going to be required. The only other recommendation I would make for your consideration is it's seven days unless it follows a Monday holiday, then it would be we could publish on the Wednesday. Is that, are we comfortable with that? I'm okay with that. Okay. But if you wanted to be adventurous and get it out the Friday before, but obviously it's going to come back for a discussion on a, on a resolution. All right. Moving on, and we'll open this to the public in a moment, but I wanted to tick off kind of where we are on these. And then the last item, please. So the last item we have is the, or suggested discussion topic, is the staff recommendation piece. Um, just wanted to clarify that though the staff recommendation is not required on the agenda itself, the proposed action must be listed on the agenda. So regardless of where the recommendation is coming from, the proposed action should be listed or has to be listed um, as per the Brown Act. And not only per the Act, but it, it's also a good business practice because it establishes transparency right away so um, the public can see what the item that the council is discussion or discussing and then the anticipated action that they will be taken. Um, in the examples I have here, these are just pulled examples from different agendas themselves. In example one, we show the subject item and then listed below, it states recommendation and then it clearly identifies that it is a staff recommendation. In example two, we have the item that's being discussed and then the direct action taking place is actually pulled. The language is pulled from the ordinance that would be adopted. In example three, we're showing just the main subject and then they break it down into two different actions. And so uh, the council can you know, possibly approve one and not the other, none or both. Um, and of course, in addition to um, these examples, it is, I threw up the Rosenberg's rule of orders because it does say that as the 
that the chair should invite the um, appropriate people to report on the item, including any recommendations they may have. And uh, that's why we like to also see it in the staff report because it clarifies and it provides support as to how they're coming up with this directed action. Thank you very much. Councilmember Williams. Yes, those are good examples. So, um, Irene, the, there's a requirement that the, um, the action be stated or the, the recommended action be stated? Right, the proposed action. The proposed is the action. Mm -hmm. So, um, could the alternatives be stated as well? Absolutely. So, the, so the, it could state um, recommend action according to the proposal. Mm -hmm or option two, uh, rejection of the proposal, or option three, revision of the proposal? Right, and most oftentimes that's also listed within the staff report itself, but if you'd rather see it on the agenda too, that's absolutely a possibility. And you see what I'm working, what I'm working at is the sense, mm -hmm. the sense that I've heard uh, many times, you know, sitting out there, um, the sense among some of the public that um, it's futile to offer uh, comment um, whether that's true or not, there's the sense sometimes that it's uh, futile because uh, decisions have already been, already been made. And look at here, here's the staff recommendation. And incidentally, this is not a this uh, idea is not a reflection at all on staff uh, whatsoever. Um, this idea has been floating around for some years now, um, and so that's what I would like to uh, avoid or get past. It's a matter of perception or optics, in a sense the sense that um, decisions have already been made and look at here, it says so right on the, right on the agenda uh, to recommend approval of this or that. And tonight's agenda, as it happens, the, the recommended actions are not a bit problematic for me. Uh, and so I wouldn't even bring it up uh, with an agenda like this. But sometimes in the past, uh, on issues that are more, uh, you know, uh, controversial, say, um, sometimes there will have been a staff recommendation. We're going back years here before you, Dylan, um, and and the public will uh, feel frustration that whether it's true or not that the decision uh, already was made ahead of time, and that the uh, council has just uh, rubber stamped what was proposed. So that's the perception that I'd like to get past, so that uh, the public feels like when it comes and makes comments that they really have bearing and and wait. And indeed, they may, I'll, I'll say they do, but the sense is not always there that that's that fact. So, in, in so, all you see, so you see what I'm getting yeah, at there. Yeah, yeah. I, I can understand that. Yeah. But in all of our staff reports, I'm scanning back as many as I can that I can recall, mm -hmm. controversial, non-controversial, staff always presents in the staff report what the options are. Um, so if it's a matter of, that's how we're formatted today, if it's a matter of formatting where the agenda itself, which could become a very long, just the top agenda could become a very long document, mm -hmm. what all of the options are that they're considering, um, that's something for, for discussion. But what you're not recommending, or what I'm not hearing you recommending, is that there isn't a staff recommendation included. Well, uh, my original suggestion was that we simply omit that line that line that says uh, staff rec uh, recommended action, or something. There's a staff recommendation line, and that's what we have on on ours. Staff recommendation approve or disapprove. Usually, it's approve, um, and that's what's that's what's challenging for for me sometimes, because sometimes you know, I don't know. In fact, many times I don't know going into uh, an item into a topic. Um, well, how do I want to feel about this, or what do I want to think about it? And um, as you see in that uh, that uh, comment from the Chronicle a year ago, it's impossible not to not to see the staff recommendation and be influenced by it. And it's not that I don't want to know, not that we don't want to know what staff thinks, because you have the expertise and uh, you've researched it and so on. So, indeed, I would want to know, uh, but I'd rather not know beforehand. I guess is what I'm what I'm getting at. Uh, because, because then I come to the meeting with that prejudice, unconscious or not, before I've had a chance to uh, hear public uh, weigh in on it. But how would we? <clears throat> how would we do that? Right. Yeah. I mean, you. We have 
a professional staff who's paid to give right. do this right part of our preparation is reading the agenda and all of the staff reports and the purpose of the staff report is to get a recommendation since we don't have a resolution here how about if I rework this how about if I talk with staff further and talk with Irene I appreciate your comments and see if see if we can uh, see if I can satisfy that concern I have and also not make the agendas unwieldy yeah, yeah. Uh, just yeah. one comment that I want to say for me the staff recommendations are are important and um, it doesn't mean that I had to do what they say um, but it gives me direction or where what is the purpose of the um, of the subject you know so uh, they are the experts they are the as Chris say are the ones they get paid to do the job and my job is to read the report and read their suggestion their recommendation and think about it and you know kind of with a decision um, sometimes it, it has to go against them or you know sometimes I have to what they say but I think had the guide uh, to me staff recommendation is to a guide for me to uh, where to go because we also have the ability to seek other information exactly. after yeah, doing and, that diligence and you understand I'm not um, I'm not uh, wanting to censor the staff at all. Mm -hmm. I still yeah, want, yeah. we still I want understand. their recommendation, um, but uh, it's available at the meeting. And for that matter, it's available, if it's not listed here, it would be available beforehand. Um, any of us could go to staff, which has been very available, uh, and we could say, Dylan, I, you know, I don't really get this thing. I don't see a recommendation. I'm glad for that, but what do you think on this? You know, what should I think about it? So. Um, the challenge, though, is for it yeah. to be included in the agenda packet. Yeah. It has to be presented in advance. Yeah. So Otherwise, we, we couldn't physically look at, legally look at, a staff recommendation yeah. presented to us at the meeting. So that's what I'm hearing. Yeah. So let me, let me uh, talk with Irene a little bit more and see if I can come to some uh, language or some approach that satisfies my concern, which I think is legitimate, and also meets the requirements of a, uh, of a useful working agenda. Councilmember Krauss. Uh, instead of the word recommendation, would proposed action uh, meet the legal requirement for posting? I guess it would, because it's the intent. I appreciate that. That's a good idea. Okay. All right. Uh, lights, Mr. Harkin. Uh, three topics here. Uh, anyone in the public want to address the council on this? Mr. McNay. <clears throat> I'm starting the clock, Dennis. Go. Okay, McNay. 2653 Foothill. Bear Flag Inn. 707 942 That was a shameless plug for oh, your business, oh, sir. Uh, why, I, like uh, was said here, you know, the recommended action, like adopt resolution or, well, actually, provide comments and draft. So this is kind of, recommendation is kind of a, looks like a direction to me. So instead of saying adopt resolution, why not just put council vote on resolution? Or consider resolution. Okay, we could, we'll, we instead could wordsmith of, this. Instead of saying yeah. adopt, you know, yeah. like. Yeah, it's already been approved. We're just stamping it through. We can, uh, well, I would love to say that no matter how much we wordsmith this. I know. We, Thank there you, you for go. your time. Anyone else? Okay, so here's what I'm hearing. Council, check, up, check with me on this. Uh, the headers and titles, um, as long as uh, we're open to making some modifications, as long as what the format we're using is most beneficial to the software that helps uh, visually impaired process this. Okay. okay. Um, item number two is we're going to go to uh, review a resolution to go to a seven-day window. Um, I can't help myself but make this joke. 
I know they use 11 in St. Helena, but maybe if St. Helena chose to go to 7 or something less than 11, they'd be in a different situation. How's that? Um, and then so we'll go to 7 unless it's after a Monday. Um, and we'll, we'll look at recommendations for that. And then on the final, um, as long as we're not proposing, because uh, I don't think this council would agree with not proposing that there not be staff recommendations included in the materials maybe it's just how they're presented on the actual agenda itself we'll talk about that okay all right yes if you don't mind if I could just make a couple comments real quick that I just I've been sitting here listening to your you know your discussions um, one thing I want to be really clear about and you know we've said this before I want to just want to make sure and reemphasize it you know staff's job is we're we're hired to implement the policies of the City Council whether it's ordinance resolution municipal code whatever it is that's our job um, so when we bring things to City Council it's because there's some requirement somewhere that says it comes back to City Council um, so when we purchase something when we're buying postage you know there's this council adopted policy that says the city can buy postage uh, can spend money up to this amount um, so I want to just want to be really clear that everyone understands when items come before City Council um, one there's some kind of requirement or something out there that says it comes to Council Council always always has the uh, policy making rule making role at the city so we, the council can always change can always make a decision you know the council always decides like we did tonight we're not comfortable on these pay increases we want more time to review let's push it back to the next meeting or providing additional comments on a letter to the county we want to include additional items that staff didn't include so you, you, the council always has an ability to do that um, one of the thoughts I just wanted to make sure that we're all you know thinking of is there's a big there's a big difference between you know one proposal to approve something and a you know an option to approve something and an option not to Take, for example, a, I'll call it a, a, a renovation, a, a development project. If you have listed on there that st and staff has been working to make sure a project meets with municipal code and, and in all these different ways, you know, Lincoln Avenue apartments, 78 units, it, it complies with the code, a recommendation to approve it. You know, what would a recommendation to deny it look like right next to it? You know, staff would have to prepare all the work, all the activities, the resolutions, the documents, to deny that project also so th I do think there would be an impact on staff just to prepare that item for your consideration um, and I I don't believe staff would be presenting something to the City Council if it really wasn't for your consideration for approval unless of course the intention was to deny something staff doesn't feel that this project meets the code meets our requirements we're recommending denial of the project so I just want to make sure that that's that that's out there and, and we're aware of it and I, and I appreciate the the, the debate um, mm -hmm. we'll prepare some uh, some some draft language for you tonight it's really just to take your input and feedback we'll prepare some uh, some possible language certainly for the first two items that were discussed but also we'll give some more thought and consideration on this third item about how the recommendations are presented clearly there's some wordsmithing we can easily do uh, but we'll make sure we fully understand what the impacts are and how we propose those options to the council at future meeting. And as elected, it's our responsibility and our job, regardless of what this material says in advance, is to come here open-minded to hear all of the input, et cetera. Um, a piece of that input, in addition to the public coming to speak, a significant piece of that input is the recommendation by professionals. So that's where I leave that. All right, with that said, unless there's any other items, I will adjourn to our next regularly scheduled meeting, which will be Tuesday, March 5th. Thank you all. Have a nice evening. Meeting adjourned.